Hi, welcome to Innovation. Today we're going to talk about a process where you can vet and test your ideas. You know, a lot of people have new business ideas or a new product idea, but they don't know what to do with it. They sit around and then sometimes they do like the poor people on Shark Tank and invest their entire life savings or mortgage their house to make a prototype and then they take it on the show and somebody says boy you know that's not a very good idea so you know we don't want to do that we want to learn a process where we can test an idea vet it quickly and, and in fact do what I call fail fast fail cheap we want to try to vest an idea, vet an idea before we spend any time effort or money on it and so today I'm going to take you through a process and, you know, I got introduced into innovation very early in my career, thankfully. When I went to Procter & Gamble, the first brand group that I got assigned to was an innovation group for the Citrus Hill Orange Juice brand. Inside P&G, they have two different brand groups working on each brand. There's one that's kind of managing the day-to-day -day business, and then there's another that's working on the innovation. What are we going to do in the next three to five years to juice the brand? Yeah, I, I get it juice the brand. So um, as I got moved into Citrus Hill Innovation Group, there were three different projects going on at the moment. There was one about how to put orange juice into a big plastic jug that had never been done before. And so there was one piece of the, of the team that was working on trying to figure that out. Seems like that would be a very simple idea. Just make a plastic jug and put the orange juice in it. Turns out it's not because you know, th this is one of the pieces where when you get into marketing, you don't have any idea you're going to be working on things like this or having to learn things like this. But turns out that oxygen can permeate through plastic. And so, uh, you know, that's what causes the juice to spoil. And, and it's at a submolecular level. And so... You know, most people would think, well, you put it in a plastic jug, it's fine. But no, there's, there's oxygen going through, and that's what causes the, the juice to degrade. And so they had found a liner that they could spray on the inside of the jug that could delay the, the spoilage date and extend the, the, the fresh date 14 extra days. But, then they had, but it cost 10 cents per bottle to do that. And so the brand group was going through this mathematical model trying to figure out, well, how much return product is that going to save us uh, from coming back versus how much is that going to cost us to put that 10 cent liner into every bottle. And so that part of the brand group was going through that iteration. They ultimately did end up putting out the plastic jug. The second part of the group was working on adding calcium to orange juice. That had never been done before. And in the early testing, it was failing quite miserably. The, the calcium would clog up and, and coagulate and either float to the bottle or come out in chunks. And so that wasn't very good. And so they were trying to figure out how do we suspend the calcium in the orange juice so that it won't clog up and it'll, it'll, it'll work as a juice. And it was taking them some science to do that. When I got assigned, I was told to take a look at the carton of orange juice. You know, the regular gable top carton, they called it, which was the, the old-fashioned carton where you had to tear open the top and pour it and then fold it back in and, and put it in the fridge. And I was asked, you know, try to see if there's some innovation we can do with that. Because it's kind of an old technology. It's been around since the 1930s. And so I went to work on it. And one weekend I went home and I bought plastic literally a hundred different types of liquids that were contained in, in different things. Everything from a two liter bottle of Coke to a, uh, a juice bottle, juices in the, in the grocery store, milk cans, milk bottles, all sorts of stuff. And I brought it home and started trying to mess with it. And ended up taking a Coke two liter bottle and cut the top off of it. And then I took an orange juice carton, cut the bottom out of it, put that up through the top, cut a little hole in the side and stuck the, the, the cap through it, taped it in with some duct tape and took it into the office on Monday morning and that's how you literally ended up with a cap on your orange juice carton 
was me screwing around one weekend with a knife, not a good thing, and uh, uh, messing around in the kitchen. And that's one of the key things that, that I've found over the years is that when it comes to innovation, most innovation doesn't come from scientists and laboratories. It comes from people in their kitchen and their garages screwing around and coming up with a better mousetrap. And so uh, as I went through my career at P&G, I kept getting put into situations where I had to uh, uh, innovate. And you know, in the previous lecture, I talked about Folgers Coffee Singles and the, the challenges we had with that. Um, but then I, I went off to Christmas vacation and I came back and I'm walking back to my desk and I'd been told about this guy that lived on the other end of the hall. His name was Doug Hall. And they said, just stay away from this guy. He's nuts. And for the first six months, I was able to pretty much, you know, not ever encounter it. But I come back from Christmas, I'm walking down the hallway and suddenly I turn around and I hear him yelling, hey, hey, Eric, hey, hey, and he's coming down and waving his hand. And I thought, uh-oh, what did I do? And he comes up to me and he says, so you and I are gonna work on a project. We're gonna go up to the University of Miami, Ohio. We're gonna see if we can get college students to drink coffee. And you know, it's just gonna be me, you and me. And I thought, okay, well, here we go. And so we basically went up to, to Miami, Ohio University and every morning we, we, were, we were trying to figure out how to we, do we increase college age students consumption of coffee. At the time, this was pre-Starbucks, at the time had consumption trends continued the way they were, the size of Folgers coffee in that time, which I think was 1988, by 2020 would have been the size, the, the entire coffee category in the United States would have just been the size of Folgers coffee. So it was shrinking considerably. And so, you know, we were tasked with trying to figure out, can we juice the consumption of coffee among younger, stu younger uh, college age students? And so we did some pre-testing and only 7% of the college students at Miami, Ohio were what we call a regular coffee drinker, which was drinking one cup of, or more per day. And so we went up with a plan to reposition Folgers Coffee as young and youthful. We came up with a new campaign. It was called Jumpstart Your Brain with Folgers. We were literally selling Folgers as a drug. Yeah. <laughs> and we had these bright colors and we, we put a brewery in that I moved up to campus and every morning at 4 a.m. I would get up and meet a bunch of sorority gals over at this brewery where we would brew 600 gallons of coffee and put them into five gallon containers. And then at 6 a.m., a bunch of frat guys would show up with pickup trucks. We'd load them into the trucks and then they would deliver them all over campus so that any exterior door to campus by 7 a.m. had fresh hot coffee waiting in one of these dispensers at the door that people could drink for free. But, you know, just putting it available for free doesn't mean anybody's going to drink it. And so, you know, we had to make some changes. We had to innovate. And so we came up with a, a fudge flavored coffee creamer that if you dumped that into a six ounce uh, cup of coffee, basically turned it into hot chocolate with a little bit of a coffee flavor. And so we invented those, we put those all over the place. We did consumer promotions where uh, all of the athletic events on campus, I was there as a sponsor and we were giving away prizes, things like uh, spring break trips from Miami to Miami, pretty good. Uh, we were giving away uh, free coffee makers. We were giving away all sorts of stuff. And, you know, one of the things that we did for, from a promotional standpoint was I went up and bought, there was only one movie theater in Oxford, Ohio, and I went in and I bought all of the movie tickets to every show on Saturday nights. And the only way that you could go to a movie on Saturday night in Oxford, Ohio, was to go to the theater and drink a cup of coffee and then you would get in for free. And so, as you can imagine, we had hordes of people down in front of the movie theater every Saturday night. Some of them got to come in and, and uh, watch the movies. The, the other ones that didn't get in, they just hung around and had a party. And we put up music and dancing and people just hung outside and drank coffee and, and had a good time. 
So, you know, we were able to, you know, basically just inundate these students with Folgers. And a funny thing happened. At the end of our two-month test, we did a post-test to see how many people were drinking one cup coffee plus per day. And to our amazement, it had gone from 7% to 91%. 91% of all students were drinking more than one, one or more cups of coffee per day. And so when we get back down to Cincinnati and report our findings, the CEO, John Smale, called us into his office. And he looks at us and he says, you know, I don't know what you did, but I like your style. You've done the impossible. And so our innovation system here at P&G is broken. And I'd like to have you guys take a crack at seeing if you can make it work better. So I'm hereby dubbing the, the Procter & Gamble Invention Team. And I want you to go outside of the system, invent new products for them, for us when they're ready to go to market, you bring them in, you put them on my desk, and I'll take it from there. So over the course of the next 12 months, we launched 11 new products for the company, a record that still exists today. And it was everything from, you know, cakes for Duncan Hines to uh, uh, new flavors of Crest for kids, um, new Hawaiian Punch, some Duncan Hines microwave stuff, one of the interesting ones was there had been a technology in the building that no one, had, no, one, no one had known what to do with. It was called Olestra. And Olestra was a cooking oil that if you cooked and fried food in it, the oil didn't absorb into your body like it does with vegetable oil and, and those kinds of things. And so, um, you know, it, it has some promise. And so they, they gave it to us and said, see what you can do with it. And we were toying with all sorts of different things, but one day we thought, let's test it and see if people notice a flavor problem. And so we hadn't noticed it when we tried it, but we, we wanted to try it on a large scale. So we went to the lunchroom at Procter & Gamble and we had them fry everything that day. Fried, fried uh, okra, fried french fries, hamburgers, uh, uh, chick, fried chicken. We had all sorts of stuff that was fried. And then we sat around the lunchroom listening to see if anybody said anything. And to our amazement, not a one person complained about any of the food. Uh, and so, you know, end of the day, we're going home, hey, great, this is awesome. You know, we, we can go to town here. And so the next morning, we drove into to, uh, headquarters to go to a meeting. And we're looking around the parking lot, and there's like nobody there. We thought, wait a minute, did we miss something? Is this a holiday? Turns out we had made just about everybody at the Procter & Gamble Company sick because if you adjust too much Olestra, it'll give you stomach cramps, stomach ache, and severe diarrhea. So we learned a little something that day, not to give too many people too much Olestra. So that led us to inventing a bunch of cookies and crackers and, and uh, Pringles chips that, you know, you'd have to eat like three, diff three bags of chips in order to get enough to, to, to give you the, the effect. So... Um, you know, we did all that, and that was a lot of fun. And then uh, we took on some outside clients at the same time. And so we were doing some projects for Citibank, and we were doing some projects for Pillsbury, and, you know, things were, were growing. And Doug said, you know what? We can make a lot more money just doing this ourselves. Why don't we start up a, a place that we, here in Cincinnati that's just dedicated to innovation? We'll call it Eureka Ranch. And I hadn't been with P&G long enough. You know, I, I still wanted to get some stripes. And so I did not move with him. But, you know, we stayed close friends. And I still work with him to this day. Uh, we're kind of brothers from different mothers. But uh, uh, he, st he went off and created Eureka Ranch, which is now the number one think tank for new product innovation in the world. Companies come to him from all over the world to sit down and have him and his team help invent new products for their companies. And so today we're going to go through that process, that system that Doug has developed over the years, and teach you how and why companies are willing to pay $250,000 to come back to Eureka Ranch for four days and have Doug lead their innovation efforts. So we're going to learn that same process. So we're going to start with brainstorming. You know, you have to come up with an idea first. And most people... Uh, have you know, kind of a, a different way of doing that. 
And so, but Doug's system is based on forming teams of people to brainstorm together. And so the client brings in maybe eight or 10 people from his side, and Doug brings in eight or 10 people from around Cincinnati that he knows that he calls trained brains. And these trained brains are just people that are very creative, like the guy who writes the Ziggy uh, cartoon. He is one of the people that comes in regularly. There's a writer uh, for the Cincinnati Enquirer that often comes. There's a baker that makes ex ex you know, really, really high-end cakes. Um, you know, just very creative people that live around town that Doug's gotten to know over the years. And he brings them in. And you mix together and you go through a brainstorming process all day long where he uses different stimulus to try to get you to think down different paths. And the stimulus is usually unrelated. So it's pushing things together that you normally wouldn't push together. For example, let's say we're working on a project for Duncan Hines and we're trying to come up with you know, new dessert ideas. And the prompt that we have is motor oil. Motor oil. How are we going to use motor oil with Duncan Hines? And so you try to start smashing them together. And you go, well, motor oil is dark, it's viscous, um, you know, it, it doesn't break down when you heat it up. Um, what if we could create a volcano cake where you put this little ball of Duncan Hines frosting inside of it or chocolate? And as the cake baked and heated, it would cause it to explode and come out the top and look like a volcano coming out the edge. Well, you never would have got to that idea without first having gone to the, you know, having motor oil as a stimulus. And so, you know, you go through these exercises all day long. And if you look at the picture here, you'll see some yellow cards. And that's how you capture ideas is you take a yellow card, you jot your idea down briefly on the card, and then you toss it on the floor. And that idea is gone now, because if you don't write it down, it'll just constipate your brain and you won't get anywhere. And so teams go through this process for about eight hours. And over the course of lots of different groups and sessions and, and stimulus, you walk away with seven, eight hundred ideas that have been, you know, seeds of ideas that have been created in these groups. Um, and so then uh, the client goes away, they go to dinner, then they come back about 7 o'clock and all the, the cards have been laid out across the room and people are given 20 stars, you know, kind of like what you got back when you were in, in church and for being a, a good kid. And you get 20 stars and you get to walk around and put stars on the ideas that you like. And so that takes about another two hours and by about 9 o'clock then the, we've got ideas that have been starred, we take the ones with the most stars and we bring them back and we start writing them up into concepts. And we'll get into that part a little later, but I want to kind of interrupt the process right now. Um, because brainstorming is where most people fail. And the reason they fail is because they, they use what I call the brain drain method of coming up with ideas. In, in brain drain, you assume that all ideas somehow exist in the cranium of your head, and all you have to do is somehow figure out a way to siphon them out. And for most of us, that's a very short, painful experience, much like constipation, where we grunt, we groan, and nothing comes out. And so, you know, we don't want a brain drain. We want to use stimulus response, which is what Eureka Ranch does, which we, you know, we use all of this stimulus to smash our brains together in ways that we would never think of before. They had a doctor from University of Oklahoma, Dr. Van Gundy came out and did a study and found that using this method basically made your brain about five times more effective at coming up with new to the world ideas. So it's kind of like, you know, if you were going to go on vacation, if you'd have no stimulus, then you're going to have to brain drain and you'll come up with the same five places you've been for the last five vacations. Let's go to Vegas, let's go to Yellowstone, let's go to Little Bear Lake, let's go to Disneyland and you are out. And so, yeah, but if we have a globe, if we have maps, if we have uh, you know, th travel guides, we can flip through them and, oh, you know, I've never been to Fiji, I wonder what's there. 
you know, and so we, we use the stimulus to come up with better, more, more ideas and better quality ideas. Innovations that tend to be successful are the ones that can affect people in a personal way. You know, we did some studies and we found that the, the ones that are most effective are things that can improve my family and my home which is kind of what I've been saying all along. How does my product and service fit into your life in a way that will make your life better? When you can make my family, my home life better, now you're talking. You know, if you can make my job and my income better, that's now you're still talking. My interests, things that can affect my family, home, job, income, and interests. Those are all really fertile areas for innovation. But where it gets murky, is when you're trying to do things that are going to improve your community or your state or your country or the world because it doesn't have a personal connection for most for most of us. You know, classic example, in Cache Valley here in Utah, it's a law that at a stop at a, at a stoplight, you're supposed to turn off your engine. Well, we, you know, when I survey students uh, about that, you know, I get like one out of 79 that say they do that during the wintertime because it doesn't affect them. They're not the problem. It's everybody else that's the problem. It's not them. So, you know, unless it affects you personally, it's really hard to get innovations to, to be successful. There's a thing that you're going to learn about soon that's called life currencies, and I want to introduce that, uh, that to you right now. Life currencies are the things that you use to evaluate things that aren't money. And you know, when we go through the purchase process, price isn't always the thing that makes us go yes or no. It could be something like, well, I don't have enough information in order to make it an informed decision. I don't think I've got the time to deal with that. It's going to take me way too much energy or human energy to do that. I don't think I've got the space for it. It's not going to be fun. I'm afraid. Um, I have angst or stress about that. It's not convenient. Uh, it's not going to make me love it. Uh, I'm not sure I can do it in a quality way. And I don't think I have the expertise. All of those life currencies come into play when you're trying to make decisions. And they're going out of the back of your head. But, we tap, but one of the places that you can find success in innovation is if you can find a product or a service that's having a problem with the life currency and fix it. Um, so, for example, you know, Swiffer. Swiffer was nothing more than a wet mop. And people hated wet mops because, you know, you had to squeeze it out, you had to keep dunking it, you had to pull the hair out of it when you were done. Well, Swiffer got rid of all those problems and, you know, made it a lot easier and less stressful to wash your floors. And so, you know, we're looking toward for things that what we call gravitational marketing things that can disrupt the market and marketplace equilibrium. And the only way you can do that is to introduce products and services that are significantly different and better than what already exists. So significantly different from what already exists. Let's look at maps. Well, you know, we used to go to the to 7-Eleven and buy a map and go on a road trip and start trying to figure out where we're going. And then Garmin's came along and they were a godsend. But, you know, then they put your maps into your iPhone, and now you don't need maps or a Garmin. You've got it all in your iPhone. You know, VCRs. Every 96% of homes had a VCR just 15 years ago. Now I dare you to find one. They don't even make them anymore. But, you know, they were replaced by DVRs, which were great for a while. TiVo thrived. But now you don't need either of those because now you can just stream everything on demand. So... As things have changed, you know, they've, they've been significantly better and different from what already existed. You have to break rules sometimes. You know, they tell you don't ride in cars with strangers. Yet, Lyft and Uber have kind of broken, broken that rule. You know, nobody's going to rent a room in somebody's house. Well, Airbnb, Verbo have kind of broken that as well. So, you know, you can't be constrained by how you think the world operates. You've got to be willing to break rules and try to step outside the box. Rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic aren't going to save it from going down. You've got to do something significantly different. When we make strong brands, 
We make a promise that creates an expectation in the customer's mind and we deliver that customer experience that precisely aligns to those three things. Now you've got a brand. And so that's also critically important in innovation. Whatever it is that you're promising to the customer, you've got to be able to deliver precisely. So, example of that not happening. At Wendy's, a few years back, Wendy's did one of the best PR campaigns I think I've ever seen. They were introducing what they called Dave's Hot and Juicy, an innovation in the hamburger that the world had never seen before. And their story was great. You know, they're all over the media saying, we have taken the last two years and we combed across the country and across the world trying to find the world's best hamburger. And, you know, we, we think we've got it. We've gone to little hamburger stands on the sides of roads and in little country towns and in big cities. And we are now proud to introduce Dave's Hot and Juicy, which is, a, which is the world's best hamburger. So I bought in. You know, hey, great. So the night that they launch, I load the family up in the car. We drive down to Wendy's. I order up four Dave's Hot and Juicies. And I start taking mine apart to see what is in this wonderful burger. And I immediately started to have some concern. I saw the hamburger patty. It was still square, just as every Wendy's hamburger had been since I was a child. It had a slice of cheese, same. It had a slice of lettuce, same. It had onion. The, only, the onion, however, was red rather than white. It had a pickle. The pickle had a crinkle to it rather than being flat. It had the same ketchup, mustard, mayo, and the bun was slightly different. Tasted just a little bit different. And I took a bite and it tasted pretty much like every Wendy's hamburger I'd ever had in my life. They lied to me. Promise, expectation, customer experience, out of whack. It took me three years to go back to Wendy's after that. And the only reason I did was because it was the only thing open late at night. And so you can't do that to people. You've got to tell the truth when you're doing, especially in innovation, because if you, set your, if you overstate your benefit and create an expectation that's unrealistic, you're going to lose every time. Eureka's... Eureka's come from stimulus on your brain operating system, overcoming the fear factor. Let me talk about that a little bit. Eureka's, you know, ideas that are fabulous, come from stimulus that you put on your brain, as we talked before. Overcoming the fear factor, now that's real. Because in order to come up with life-changing ideas, world-changing ideas, something significantly different and better than what already exists, sometimes you've got to come up with really stupid ideas first because sometimes that stupid idea morphs into the beautiful one. Story time. So a few years ago, I, Doug called me back to Cincinnati to work on a project for rum with a brewery out of Scotland, Edrington Breweries. And they had the number one product in the category in every category in which they competed except for rum. And they wanted to try to figure out how to break that cycle. And so we did an entire brainstorming day of, of looking at trying to you know, reposition rum in a different way that was different, better, special, and better. And so you know, one of the paths that we went down for exploration in terms of stimulus was where in history had rum played a role? And we discovered that the guys at, uh, at Boston Harbor, when they were dumping all the tea into the harbor, they were all looking it up on rum. Interesting. George Washington served rum at his first presidential inauguration. There was, when, when prohibition started, people were smuggling rum into town in, in buckets that looked like people were carrying their business down to the river. And so, you know, we explored all of those different paths. We also discovered that rum played a significant role in Ernest Hemingway's life. And there was a bar in Cuba, in, in Havana, called the El Floridito. And that's where the, the, the fruity rum drinks all started from. And he was there when that happened. 
And so we, we created concepts for all of these different types of, of experiences, and it turns out that 1776 became the new brand, um, which was, you know, the, the rum of the American Revolution. And so uh, it is doing quite well. In innovation, your only limitation is your own imagination. And, you know, I have to show you this thing called the product life cycle. It's part of every marketing book in the world. And it was invented by some Harvard guy back in the 1960s. And the premise behind it is that, you know, when your brand starts, it'll start off slowly, and then you'll gain some momentum. And then, you know, if it's good, it's going to have phenomenal growth. But then, at some point, competition is going to come in. You're going to kind of cap out. And as the competition comes, you're going to have to start cutting your costs because, you know, they're, they're out there too. And the only way to maintain your market share is to cut your costs, which is going to cut your profit. And then at some point, you're just going to decline and go away. And that's a theory that works sometimes. If you do nothing, that's exactly what will happen. You know, let me show you a couple of examples. So this is the life cycle of the iPod. You know, back when it was introduced in 2002, you know, had a s slight growth. And then by 2004, man, it took off. And by 2006, it was rocking and rolling. And then by 2007, you had knockoff brands starting to come in. They were starting to steal market share. And in 2008, something significant happened. The, introducing of the, uh, the introduction of the iPhone. And by 2014, iPod is dead because it had been supplanted by either the cheap knockoffs or the iPhone. There was no need for an iPod anymore. Let's look at the life cycle now of iPhones. Introduced in 2008, had kind of a slow ramp up through 2011, then it really took off between 2011 and 2015 and 16. Then it kind of capped out, and it's been you know kind of slowly declining since. Well, is that going to continue? Who knows? But, you know, is somebody going to come up with a better iPhone at some point? Probably. So, you know, if, if you fail to innovate, then, you know, this is precisely what's going to happen, which is why Apple continually innovates. You know, every year they discontinue their best-selling iPhone and they ramp it up with a new version. Now, it's getting harder for them to do that because, you know, back in the early days, adding new features was easy. Now they pretty much added everything, and since the, the 5K or the 5G uh, introduction, there hasn't been a lot of improvement other than you know, a few features and better cameras. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out over time. You know, yesterday the life cycles were very slow. Now they can be very fast. Um, you know, but the thing is, where product life cycle does work, is if you innovate. Because when you innovate, you basically wait until you hit the top of the, of the graph, and then you innovate, and you restart the graph. And so Tide is a perfect example. If, if, if the product life cycle thing were true, all of our legacy brands would be dead, right? Right? Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't have Tide, you wouldn't have Coke, you wouldn't have you know, products that were available back in the 1930s, 1940s. They'd all be dead. But they innovate. You know, Tide, 61 innovations in 61 years. Think about all the things that they've come up with recently, from Tide Pods to Tide Pens to Tide with Febreze to Tide with, with Downey. You know, they, they keep continually changing. It's restarting the curve, and they stay on top. I mean, they've been the number one brand in America for 30 years, and it's not going to change anytime soon because they just keep innovating. You know, iPhone, like I said, you know, the iPhone, they... they innovate every single year to try to keep making it better. Companies that have innovation as their core strategy make more money because they're selling things that other people don't have. Therefore, they can charge a premium for it. So, you know, you, you, you always want to try to have innovation as your core brand strategy if possible. Because if you're not meaningfully unique, you better be cheap. In every product category over time, prices decline. You know, think about just 4K TVs. If you roll the, the clock back to 2015, when they first were introduced, you know, they were going for $3,000. Now, you can go down to Walmart and pick one up for 400 bucks, 
that's 65 or 70 inches. And so, you know, as, as more competition, as more, different, as more manufacturers come in, and as more uh, manufacturing efficiencies come in, prices decline. And so, you know, you have to keep innovating in order to maintain a high price. When you work in innovation, you basically end up in one of two camps. Either you feel like you're brilliant, like Ben Franklin, or you end up over in Frankenstein's camp where you've got to kill it, kill it now before it pillages the village or your bottom line. And so unfortunately, most innovation falls over in Frankie's camp. Let me tell you a couple of stories. The first is about Crystal Pepsi. Crystal Pepsi, I was at its birth. It was a eureka session that we were doing in Cincinnati for Pepsi. And we were innovating and we were using drugs as our piece of stimulus. And so, you know, one of the ideas that came out of it was marijuana Pepsi. I get it, marijuana Pepsi. That's pretty cool. Um, you know, and then somebody said, well, what about crystal meth Pepsi? Yeah, that'd be cool, crystal meth Pepsi. Um, you know, and then, it, you know, we, we developed all those ideas, and then you kind of have to drag them back down into reality. And so, you know, as we were trying to drag crystal meth Pepsi down into the realm of reality, uh, you know, the, the, the Pepsi people were just fixated on this name, Crystal Pepsi. And so, you know, it came back down to, well, what if we made it clear? What if we made it look like 7-Up or Sprite, but it was Pepsi? And they were all jacked up about that. And Doug and I took their, their senior vice president to the back room at the next break, and we said, no, your folks are all jacked up about this idea, but it's a gimmick. It's not going to work. It's not, that's not innovation. That's just a gimmick. And so, you know, one of the da the, the one of the challenges of doing innovation down at Eureka Ranch is that, you know, you, you work on a project, you give the, the client ideas, they walk away, and sometimes you don't see them show up in the marketplace for years. And so a couple years later, I'm laying at my couch. I was then working for Disney. I'm laying on my couch in Los Angeles watching the Super Bowl, and to my horror, a commercial comes on for Crystal Pepsi. And I'm like, wait, what? Um, and, you know, sure enough, they dropped $20 million advertising Crystal Pepsi in the first two months. It was everywhere. And most people went out, bought one, took a sip and said, ah, it tastes like Pepsi. And that was the end of it. In six months, it was dead. So, you know, significantly different from what already exists isn't just changing the color of Pepsi. I've never once heard anyone say, boy, I love the taste of Pepsi, but I hate that brown color. They were not solving a problem. <laughs> It was a gimmick. And so we got to make sure that we solve problems with our innovations. Let me tell you the story about New Coke. When I was at Coke, they brought back all the players that had been involved with the introduction of New Coke. And they gave us a full day seminar on what went wrong. And it was fascinating because, you know, it, it was one of those things where if you don't understand the past, if you don't remember the history, it will repeat itself. And so they took us through, you know, the, the market and where it was at that point in time. Pepsi had been slowly gaining traction among youth. You know, historically, Pe Coke has always had about a 20% share uh, buffer over Pepsi. And, you know, for, for decades, it kind of never changed. And then Pepsi had introduced in the early 70s this new campaign that was called Pepsi the choice of a new generation. And they had hired Michael Jackson and Madonna, two of the highest, biggest pop stars of the time, to push Pepsi and make commercials for them. And that was, that was making headway into the youth segment. Simultaneously, they'd also been running a long-term campaign for four or five years that was called the Pepsi Challenge, where they would film people outside of grocery stores doing a blind taste test between Coke and Pepsi, and trying to and, and say which one do you prefer, and, and like eight out of ten were preferring Pepsi. And of course, this was the 1970s when sugar was king, and nobody thought about sugar was doing any damage to you other than maybe a few cavities, and so nobody cared. So the people at Coke came back and said, "Well, we got to figure out why we're losing." And so they put the scientists on it, and they came back and they discovered that Coke, or that, that Pepsi. In, in science, you measure sugar in what's called bricks. Pepsi had eight bricks of sugar. 
Coke had six and a half bricks of sugar. So Pepsi was basically about 25% sweeter than Coke. So they take the Coke formula, they add more sugar to get it up to nine bricks of sugar. So they're parity with, with uh, Pepsi. And they relaunch Coke as new Coke. Small problem. You have all these people that like Coke, don't like Pepsi, and they took one sip of the new Coke and went, it's way too sweet. So they ran out, bought up all the old Coke, and started protesting. And it was brutal. Pickets started showing up outside of Coke plants all over the country. There were so many phone calls coming in to complain at the, at the consumer line at Coke that it broke the phone system in Atlanta for three days. And so, you know, suddenly they're going, well, people get over it. Now, for two weeks, nobody got over it. And it's, there's, it's just becoming this huge thing now. The media is reporting on it. People are going on, you know, writing stories and complaining. And so, you know, they decide, well, we got to do something, so we better bring back old Coke. And so they're sitting around the table going, well, how do we bring back old Coke? And somebody said, well, that's a really lousy name. You can't have old Coke and new Coke. And so somebody said, what about classic Coke? Coca-Cola classic. Yeah, that's it. So that's literally how much time they thought about renaming Coke classic. But you can't just snap your fingers and have co new Coke classic come back out everywhere because you've got to make all the syrup in Atlanta. It's got to get shipped out to all the bottlers. You've got to redesign packages and cans and all sorts of stuff and get them shipped out to the bottlers so they can put them in it. So there's about a two-month to three month delay before they could re reintroduce Coca Cola Classic. And so they finally do that. And, you know, when Co New Coke was the only thing available at, versus Pepsi, Pepsi had taken the lead in market share. But when Coca Cola Classic came out, it went right back to where it always had been 60 40, and it never has changed since. So, you know, it's kind of a you know, telling story that you know, you got to make sure that you've done your research and you're not just making knee-jerk reactions to the competition because you, know, you can screw yourself up pretty quickly. You know, my biggest faux pas in innovation came with the XFL in its first iteration. You know, we had great logos, we had really lousy football players, <laughs> and so uh, you, know, you can have the best marketing in the world and it's not going to fix a bad product. Creativity is intelligence having fun, said Albert Einstein. And that's the beauty of working in innovation, is you get to be creative. And so, but, but, but there's a, a downside to it. 85% failure rate. 85% of all new products, services, and business launched fail within the first year. That's pretty daunting. 85% failure rate. 15% success rate. You're flying with a with a, without a net, it's a high risk area to be in. It can be a career catapult or a career changer. And so you gotta make sure you're in the right situation in order to you know, kind of do this. But this is why the, the Eureka system is so important. We're gonna loop back to that now. Common problems that people have when they do innovation is they Talk about features and not benefits. When we talk about features, let's look at just a, a simple laptop computer. The features would be its internet connectivity and its RAM and its, its memory and its speed and all those, and the chip that's in it. That's all features. But most of us don't understand all of those things. All we want is a computer that's going to be able to be really fast, store all of our stuff, and connect seamlessly to the internet. Those are the benefits. So you gotta talk about benefits, not just the features. You gotta be innovating to be first to market, not coming up with what I call me too market, me too products, which are products that are just, you know, you're making a copy of something that somebody else has already made. Failing to communicate using kitchen logic, pasting brand names over the top. And so I wanna tell you a story. So I was doing a consulting project with ConAgra Foods uh, and the old El Paso brand. And they had, they had developed a salsa 
that was made for Cajun food. You know, you put it on top of your jambalaya and stuff, and it was amazing on top of the jambalaya. And so, you know, they they wanted they were talking about how do we launch this, and the salespeople wanted to call it Old El Paso, you know, Cajun mix, Cajun style, because there there are a lot of easy reasons to do that. Number one, you know, it, it fits in with the line of salsas that you've already got for Old El Paso. You can just slide it over, slide it in. You've got your shelf space. You can market it together with all the Old El Paso things when they go on sale. But the downside is it's not Mexican, which is what all of the Old El Paso brand is. It's not Mexican food. It's made for Cajun food, and it's gonna, it's not going to go well on a taco. So there was a lot of argument. You know, if you have to launch it on its own, it's going to cost more. You're going to have to put it in a different part of the store that they don't have sales distribution in. You're going to have to spend to market it. Uh, so you know, there's 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 going to be it's going to be more costly to do it the other way. Couldn't decide, so we decided to do a test. So we put it in a test. In one market, we put it out as Old El Paso Cajun style, and in the other market, we put it out as its own product, which I'll get to in a second. Within hours of the product appearing on the shelf, consumer complaint lines started lighting up from the city where they put it in the Old El Paso section. And if you ever work for a company that has consumer complaint lines, take some time and go listen to the calls. They're, they're highly entertaining and uh, you know, you'll learn a lot. So I'm listening to the consumer complaint line, and this one call I still remember vividly. This guy calls up and says, hey, uh, I, I just got some old El Paso taco sauce, and I just put it on my taco. It, it tastes weird. I, I think you got botulism in it or something, because it just, it just don't taste right. I've been using your products for years and years and years, and yeah, I've never had a bottle like this before. <laughs> and so... Uh, with, with lots and lots of those complaints coming in, we quickly pulled it and went ahead and launched it as its own prob pr product, which was ass kicking Cajun hot sauce, kick your ass hot. And we put it over in the Cajun section and it still lives there today. So, you know, you, you gotta, you, you can't try to, to shortcut, you can't try to shove it in where things don't belong. You gotta make it its own product if it's, if it's, stand, if it's gonna stand on its own. Common success factors, you know, being new and different, different, better, special, addressing consumer needs better than anything out there, communicating it clearly with a great name that aligns to the benefit, ass kicking, raging Cajun hot sauce. Got it. I understand what that is. Demonstrating the benefit with a sound reason why, writing up your brand positioning. So now we're going to loop back to Eureka Ranch, and, you know, we've taken you up through the process now of having the, the ideas vetted, having the stars put on them, and now we collect up all the ones that have got stars on them, and now we need to write those up into what we call concepts. And so Doug and I and the writer from the Cincinnati Inquirer will lock ourselves in a back room and we'll take all of those seeds of ideas and we'll write them up and we'll go through a process. And that the process is first you, you write it into a brand positioning statement. And then from the brand positioning statements, you write it into a concept. And then you take that concept and you test that on people to get their feedback. And so we will spend all night long writing up these concepts. And by uh, about 4 a.m., we'll have 70 to 80 concepts written between the three of us. And then the client comes in on the next morning and a miracle has happened. You know, suddenly there's, there's all these ideas that have been written up and, and seem real. So, you know, when you create a product name, you have to determine its target audience, its benefits, its reason why, to write it up in the brand positioning statement, and then write it as a one paragraph ad for what the product would be. And that's what we call the concept statement. That's what we're going to show to consumers. We have to go through that process first to make sure that we're writing it correctly. So, you always want to start with a problem. If you're not solving a problem, then you're just a gimmick, like Crystal Pepsi. You always have to start with a problem and then offer a solution. So problems that tend to work best 
are frequent annoying problems that you can solve or infrequent problems that but really bad things happen when they happen. You know, the infrequent problems would be like, you know, gnats around your head on the summer day um, when you're out in the middle of a park. Or infrequent problems would be things like, well, you know, a baby dying in the back seat of, a, of, a, of an automobile accident. So, you know, those are the two areas that kind of lend themselves to, the, to be most effective. So, I'm going to take you through an example. And this is one that Doug and I did with Citibank years ago. So the problem that we were faced with was lost or stolen credit cards. You know, they can, it's an infrequent problem, but when it does happen, really bad things happen. You know, you can have identity theft, you can have unauthorized charges on your card, your credit score will go down, uh, you, it takes years to fix those things. So, you know, how do you fix credit card fraud? And so that's the problem we were working on. And so one of the ideas that we came up with was a photo embedded credit card where you, in, on the yellow card, that's all it was written, was a photo embedded credit card with the line, the perfect way to protect your account if your card is ever lost or stolen. And so that's what the yellow card said. Then we needed to bring that back and try to make it sound real. So we turned it into a brand positioning, a target audience of adults 18 to 65 who use credit cards. The benefits protects you against credit card fraud if your card is ever lost or stolen. And the reason why, because your picture and signature are embedded on the front of the card, making it virtually impossible for someone other than you to use it. So that then became the, the basis of writing it into what we call a concept. And the concept was this, photo ID credit cards. Again, you want to name the product as, as explicitly as possible so there's no guessing. Photo ID credit cards. And then you put in what we call the subline. The subline is just one sentence that captures the essence of the idea. So if I read no further, I know what this is about. The subline for this, the perfect way to protect your, your account if your card is ever lost or stolen. And then when we write the concept, you typically start it by framing the problem so that the consumer understands what problem is you're solving. So in this case, are you worried about losing or having someone steal your credit card? A credit card issue can ruin your credit score and can cause years of frustration trying to undo the damage. And then, in the second paragraph, you outline your, pro your solution. Introducing photo ID credit cards from Citibank, the safest credit card ever made against fraudulent use. That's because your photo and signature are embedded on the front of the card, stopping thieves from even thinking about using it. Sign up today for your photo ID card and protect your credit. So, that is what we share with consumers. We share that concept with them and we, we let them read it and then we measure it on two different measures. We want to find out only two questions because the answers to those two questions will tell us whether or not we need to move forward. The first question is we want to find out their purchase intent. How likely would they be to buy that product? The second is how new and different is this? versus things that are already available in the marketplace. And the idea has to score highly in both cases. If, it, if it's something that people want to buy, but there's already something out there that's like it, well, you're all, then you're just making a Me Too product. So that doesn't count. And if somebody's going to buy it, then you're out of business to start with. So we only ask those two questions. Purchase intent, how likely would you be to buy the product? And second, how new and different is this versus things that already exist in the marketplace? So when we look at products, I've shown you this graph before, but you know, the more you push out to be dramatically different, you know, the, the responses from purchase probability go all over the map. You get a whole bunch of ideas that are horrific, that have really low purchase intent, and, but highly new and different. And then if you get a few, that have high purchase intent and that are highly new and different. Those are the ones that are going to be the gigantic winners. But there's no process on earth where you can just get the highs without going through a bunch of the lows. So at the ranch, 
you know, like I said, it starts off with seven, eight hundred ideas. We write up maybe 70 of them. And then after we test them with consumers, we, and they end up walking away with maybe seven at the end of the day. And so fail fast, fail cheap. If we had 800 ideas, 793 of them get tossed in the can before the client walks out the door. We want to test the ideas quickly, fail quickly, without spending any time, effort, or money. So we go through what we call cycles of learning. Cycles of learning, where we plan, in this case we write the concept. We do, we execute the research. We study the results and then we take action. Do we throw it? Do we revise it and try it again? And so as we go through this cycle of learning, plan, do, study, act, plan, do, study, act, you do that repeatedly. You don't just do it once. That's where people fail because they come up with an idea, they launch it, they never go through any testing at all, and that's why 85% fail because they did not go through any cycles of learning. Every time you do a cycle of learning, you cut your risk in half. So just doing one test cuts your risk of failure from 85% down to 42.5%. Do it twice, you cut it down to 21.2%. Do it three times, you cut it down to 10%. Do it four times, you cut it down to 5%. Now you flipped that flipped it on its ear. Instead of having an 85% failure rate, you've got a 95% success rate because you've tested, 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 tested to improve it each time. The chances of coming out of the gate with the, uh, with the correct idea, first shot, is almost zero. You've got to tweak it, tweak it, tweak it, tweak it, and that's what the Eureka process goes through. So let me tell you how they tweak it. After the concepts are written, they put it out into quantitative research. They run a survey. They send it to a thousand people. They get feedback. They take that feedback and revise the concepts that do well. They throw out the ones that didn't. Then they bring in a focus group and they share the ones that made it through the cut with the people in the focus group and they have a discussion about those. They sometimes are revising those even as the focus group is going on. They'll fix them. They'll throw out some more. They'll take a second focus group and share those ideas with them, the ones that have made the cut, and then, again, tweak them, tweak them, and then finally put them back out into another survey to get some more quantitative research. And over four cycles then, ideas that make it through all the way, all through four, which is usually in the vicinity of five to seven ideas, are the ones the companies walk out with, with almost a guaranteed success. So... That is why we go through this process, and that is why you have to test things. You don't just throw things against the wall and hope they stick. You have to go through this process, and so we're going to learn how to do this process.